Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Messiah Christian Church. Good to see all of you this morning. Uh, we're thrilled uh, to have you here today as a family as we uh, worship in community. If you're online, uh, you're as much a part of Messiah Christian Church as those of us who are in person. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, we're glad to have you with us. Go to the comment section and fill out the connect card so we can get to know you better and learn how we can pray for you. Please fill out the connect card and uh, we would really be grateful for that. Also right now, we'd love to have you share this broadcast with friends who may need encouragement. Share it to a group or maybe to a news feed or share it now. Start with a party watch, whatever. However, today we begin the church season of Advent. Advent means coming. Each year we ask a family to come and light our Christmas Advent wreath and to do a reading. Just today, Jeff and Elaine Moisel are going to come and they'll be doing our reading and they'll be lighting the candle for us. Good morning. We'll be reading Matthew 24, verse 36 to 44. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if, in, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer. Our spirits by thine advent here disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to fly. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall 
shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, the desire of nations by in one the hearts of all mankind bid thou our sad division cease and be thyself our king of peace rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Thank you, guys. At this time, we're going to have a few announcements, and Bernice had an announcement she'd like to make. So we dressed up today because on Friday, we are going to be having a Christmas carol sing-along. You do need to register online. We will be serving cookies and hot chocolate. We'll be dressed like we are right now to be able to lead you in Christmas caroling outside. Bring a chair and a blanket if you'd like to sit outside of your car, or you can stay in your car and enjoy singing with us. It's on, on Friday at 6 p.m. Thank you. Ruth, Ruth had an announcement she'd like to make. Um, we started our Christmas blessing uh, tree last week, and folks, the response was great. Uh, but we still have five little cards left there for tags for some children so that they'll have a gift. Um, we do this because we want to make sure that children have gifts and families are blessed come Christmas time. Last year we sent uh, gifts into the school to some homeless children or children that were living in a shelter, and it meant the world. One child hung on to his gift because that was the only gift he was going to get for Christmas. And so this is important. It's been a tough year for everybody. And so to help some of the children and families, we can't go into the school this year, but we can help folks in our own church. So if you would like to take a tag, um, if you're on Facebook, just say, I will take one, and I'll get in touch with you. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, but like I say, we only have uh, five left. So if we can get those scooped up, I'm sure that folks will have uh, a wonderful blessing and you'll be blessed also um, by helping them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth. Also, since we're limited to uh, 50 people, uh, we're asking you to fill out uh, and register a full number of people that are coming. Children and youth must register on the website and attend services in our recreation center. All children under age of four and their families, please call the office to make arrangements. And adults should register for the sanctuary. We ask that you wear your face mask and you remain six feet apart. Also a reminder, uh, upcoming Christmas events uh, that we're having, and uh, please note them and know uh, we're trying to make this such a great Christmas. Amen? At this time, uh, let's take up our tithes and our offerings. And... Um, First of all, this whole Thanksgiving week, I really want to say that I'm uh, grateful to you guys for, for who you are, but also for your faithful giving. I want to encourage you, uh, even in a difficult time, you got to keep doing what's right. Amen? You all know that, right? I was reading Galatians 6, 9. Uh, God says, let us not, not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, you shall reap if, if you don't lose heart. Big if, huh? If. <laughs> if you don't lose heart. And so, I know it's not an easy time, but I really want to be clear with you. It's not a time for you to give up. Amen? Not a time for some of you to quit. Amen? And it's definitely not a time to disobey God. Don't do that. Amen? We're called to give. Be faithful to give. <laughs> uh... 
we are not servants of our circumstances. Yes, we are servants of God. God is the one who keeps your record. Not people and not this society. God alone. Amen? So do not, do not grow weary. Amen? Stay faithful to the Lord. In a minute on your screen, a slide is going to come up for various ways to give. It's also a link in the Facebook comment section that links to our PayPal account. If you're here in person, um, please drop your offering in the uh, offering basket. Maintain social distancing. Um, before we do anything, let's pray and ask God's blessing over our giving. Heavenly Father God, we, we believe your word. Your word is very clear, not to grow weary. We take it seriously, Lord. We want to maintain faithfulness, God, to you in our giving. And so, God, uh, direct our steps. Let us not grow weary. Uh, you're our strength. You're our hope. You're our source. <laughs> we turn to you right now, and we ask you to strengthen us to do what's right, Lord. May we give. May you honor it. And, God, may you use our lives for your name and your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Up our Bibles this morning and uh, today uh, we're looking at Ephesians uh, chapter 3 and uh, this is one of the richest and really one of the most uh, significant of all the passages in the Word of God and the reason I say that is because uh, it really clearly directs us uh, really how we are to live and if you do this uh, I can guarantee you it'll change your whole life. Uh, so these passages uh, really uh, help show how we are to live, and we talked to you last week about we have all this over here, right? We know that from Ephesians 1, chapter 1, 2, and 3, and we know you and I have what? You have everything, right? The Bible is very clear in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3. You, you have all of God's riches, you have all of God's wisdom. You have all of God's peace, you have all of God's love, you have all of God's patience, you have all of God's forgiveness, you have all of God's grace. So we are rich for sure, amen? And then we talked about over here, uh, we have life situations, what's going on in our daily lives, uh, how we're living, difficulties we may be facing, uh, things that are happening in our family. We have all this over here, right? And so... 
We've been looking at um, what I'm calling the, ignis, the ignis, ignition switch, right? And I said that there has to be a way to go from here to this. And I call this the ignition switch. So the switch has got to be turned on, right? Without the switch going on, uh, we're not going to be able to take that life and incorporate it here. So that's why I say this whole chapter in Ephesians 3 is so powerful, because that switch has got to go on. Amen? And last week we talked about, I think, one of the key switches is the inner man. Amen? It's not the outer man. I know the outer man. Everyone's concerned about the outer man. But how many know that means nothing? Absolutely nothing. People live this way all the time. But really, God's concerned about what? The inner man. And so today, uh, I wanted to look at these because actually in this, there are five things we can do to turn on the ignition. One is in verse 16, where Paul begins to pray that we might be strengthened with might by his Holy Spirit, where? In the inner man, not the outer man. The work is done in the inner man. And so I explained to you last week that we have to really allow the Holy Spirit to be in control. Your inner man uh, will be strengthened when the Holy Spirit has control of it. And so all of us are called to yield, yield to the Spirit of God. Remember that from last week? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, amen? You yield to the work on the inner man that the Spirit of God is doing in you. When you and I no longer rule yourself, because that's what everybody does, right? It's self-rule. But you're not being ruled by yourself, correct? You're being ruled by the Holy Spirit. You're yielding to the Holy Spirit, um, and when you no longer live for yourself, you, you, you just live moment by moment, step by step. And you're putting your trust in the Spirit of God. You yield control daily to the Holy Spirit. Yes or no? It's really foundational. Without that, very little is going to happen in your life. There has to be that strengthening in the inner man. I want to define spiritual growth, and um, I know I've done this before, but I want to remind you, spiritual growth is a process of the decreasing frequency of your sinfulness. Let's say that together. Spiritual growth is the process of decreasing frequency of sinfulness, and really that's what God wants us to do. And how does sin decrease? Sin decreases in all our lives as you yield to the Holy Spirit. Because if you're yielding to the Holy Spirit, then you're finding strength in your inner man. And then it becomes easier to say yes to the work of the Holy Spirit and no to your flesh. Amen? And that is what all of us need to do. And it's so critical So this is where it all begins. We talked about that. All begins with the strengthening of the inner man through the power of the Holy Spirit in the inner man. And so today, I want to continue to add to this ignition. Uh, That is just step one. Today, I'm going to look at a few more steps, uh, and you're going to see how a Christian really uh, can live a, a fulfilling life for the Lord And uh, this is transformational. We've been called, I call it, the Christian ignition. And so today I want to look at step number two. Once that inner man is being strengthened, it's going to lead to this second step that the Bible says. And it's called uh, the indwelling Christ. And so... We need to come to an understanding about this concept of the indwelling of Jesus Christ. And this is really, really critical for us to do, this second step. And so, um, I want you to look at your scripture, see what the word has got to say. Uh, And it's in verse 17. 
It says now, Ephesians 3, 17, uh, that Christ may settle down or be at home or dwell in your heart. And we do this by faith. Amen? And so that's step number two. So I really want to unpack this for you so you can understand how this actually works. So when you become a believer, uh, you personally accept Christ into your life. And then Christ dwells in you in his fullness. He's fully in you. You, you don't need more of him, correct? Uh, he's there. And he's already full. His whole life is actually in you. Not part of his life. His whole life is in you. The Greek word here uh, for dwell or settle down actually means that Christ wants to be at home in you. He wants to settle down. It's a verb. And it's in the present tense, which means uh, that his presence in you is always there. Always there. And, hopefully for all of us, that reality that Christ is living inside you is getting deeper and deeper and deeper every single day of your life. This is really, really important to be able to do. However... It is your continual yielding to the Spirit, more and more, that actually causes the indwelling Christ to settle down and permeate your life in greater ways. I want you to look at this slide. Can you put up that slide? So you understand really what's happening here. Christ permeates in proportion to your willingness to yield. Yes or no? It's actually how it happens. Christ permeates in proportion to your willingness and my willingness to yield. The more we yield, the more he permeates you. Yes? That's what the scripture is actually teaching here. I want to give you an example. I was thinking about my mother when my mother moved in with uh, our family, uh, it took her uh, an adjustment period, and she stayed in our apartment um, for the first month. And when she was there for the first month, she really didn't come out very much. Uh, she pretty much stayed in her room. But over time, as she became more comfortable, as she yielded to the idea that this was her new home, guess what happened to her? She started to permeate the house. It was very wonderful to watch. She went from her room to eventually she started coming upstairs. She started coming upstairs and eventually she started to eat with us. Eventually after learning to eat with us as a family, she actually started cleaning the house. After cleaning the house, she felt it was comfortable cook and so the more she yielded yes the more she yielded the more and more she filled the house with her presence I mean oh Jesus Christ is exactly the same it's exactly that same analogy the more we yield right the more of his presence the stronger we sense we are because he is in control of our life it's an amazing thing, really. I always get blown away by it. <laughs> Think about it. The Lord Jesus Christ, who saved you from all your sins, is living inside you. Does that not blow you away? Uh, the one who laid hands on the sick, touched them and healed them, lives where? Inside of you. The one who created the whole world, heaven and earth, right, lives where? Lives inside of you. Wow, I don't know about you, but I, the more I think about it, uh, that God himself lives within the believer, not in part, but in what? Full. 
He's fully there for you. And he wants to dominate your life so that you will be able to live Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. So, if you follow the instructions of Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, eventually you get to Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to read this, chapter Ephesians 4, 13, because this, this is the part of the ignition, and it must be turned on. <laughs> it must become a reality for you. It's a way of life. Ephesians 4, 13 says, we become what? We become mature, and we attain to the what? whole measure to the whole measure of what of the fullness of christ <laughs> isn't that awesome the fullness of christ in this case means we become christ-like uh, that wonderful savior who's able to do all things and do it well christ permeates us he takes over every part of us every fiber every ounce of your being with his personal power, with his person, and with his presence. It is totally, totally amazing. And as your life and my life come under his control, we are now being directed by him. We are now being guided by him. We are now being cleansed by him. We are being led by him. And when that's happening for you and for me, Christ is dwelling. He's settling down. He's making his home inside of you. Wow. And when Christ is at home in your life, then... We can handle life as he would handle life. Yes or no? If Christ is in control and he's in you and you're submitting to him, then you can now live like he lives. Correct? Wow. We can handle life differently. We consent to be yielded totally to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You yourself become like Jesus Christ. Wow. So now, if you understand, and he takes over, now what? You're kind. Yes? You're sacrificial. Yes? You forgive people. You let go of things. You live a holy life. Why? Because he's living inside of you. And the effects of that is he takes over your life. It's an amazing process, amen? Think about how powerful this is because this is the life of a Christian. It's the very essence of what it means to be a Christian. God wants to conform your life to Jesus Christ who lives inside of you in his fullness and he wants you and I to come to full maturity of his life that is inside of me and you. Wow. How many of you are all good with that? How many of you have consented to this, by the way? Because that ignition cannot be turned on <laughs> until you consent to it, until you say, you know what? I understand this and I understand this. But the way I want to live is not only him doing the work in the inner man in me, right? Now I'm going to understand that he fully indwells me. He lives inside of me. And because of that, my life is going to completely change. It's no longer about you. It's about Jesus Christ. Wow. What a switch to turn on. <laughs> what a way to live. So, when this happens, it actually leads to a third purpose 
that Paul wants to speak with us about in the transformation process. Inner man transformed. Christ dwells in me. And now, a very powerful, powerful way. You see what's going to happen next? You're going to have a love-filled life. Is that not great? <laughs> it is really amazing what God will do when we consent and we lay down our own lives. I want you... I want to uh, tell you a story. Um, my parents came from Ireland, uh, and my parents were really hard-working farmers. My parents never went past the sixth grade, my mom or my dad, one-room schoolhouse. And so when my parents came here, uh, I rarely saw a book in my house. My parents never read books. My parents actually learned to read the newspaper. But what happened to me was no one ever read to me or taught me what I might need for school. Think about that. And then add to that that I'm a hyperactive kid. <laughs> Not a good combination, right? Always running around, never sitting in one place for more than one second. And as a result... I left first grade not knowing the first thing about reading. I struggled with it, uh, and I can remember feeling really bad about myself not knowing. But they, they, set, they actually passed me, and I went to second grade. Uh, but when I got to near the end of the second grade, guess what? I still couldn't read. I couldn't read, and then the school came, and they said, I like to use the word or don't like to use the word, stayed back. <laughs> I flunked. I flunked second grade. And so they recommended that I had to go back to second grade. Now, my mother never read to me, but my mother was smart. Um, I can remember her going to school with me and them telling my mom that I, I had to go back to second grade. Uh, and she knew they were right. Uh, she also knew my confidence was being destroyed uh, and hurt by a very, very fragile self-image. I was the kid who felt invisible. Growing up in an alcoholic home, um, there was very little uh, personal conduct, uh, contact with me. My parents could only give me what they had received from their parents. And guess what? They didn't receive very much from their parents in the area of nurturing. So my mom did something amazing. She took me out of school. <laughs> she decided she wanted to put me in a private school. And she went there because we didn't have any money. And I remember her going. And she asked for a payment plan. And she enrolled me in a second grade in a different school. The fact that I stayed back would be less obvious and other kids wouldn't know about it so they wouldn't ridicule me. But guess what? On the inside, I'm a what? I'm a failure. I knew I was a failure, even if you change schools. Uh, even at the age of seven, I felt like nothing good can ever happen to me. I believed that with my whole heart. But my life was going to turn around because there was a person who actually lived Ephesians 3.17. Can you imagine that? They actually lived that out. She was a woman, um, and she lived a love-filled life. She knew that when she accepted Jesus Christ, she knew it, that Christ loved her how? Unconditionally. She knew it. She was like, God's not mad at me. God loves me unconditionally. She got it. And when she learned that, she now lived a love-filled life for me. You see, when Christ fills you, he indwells you, right? 
you now live a love life, right? Christ fills you, love fills you. Look at verse 17, Ephesians 3, 17. It goes on and it says, when Jesus Christ dwells where? Not on the outside, dwells in your heart. He's concerned not about your external self. He's concerned about your internal. He dwells in your hearts. We are. Tell me what you are now. You are rooted and you are grounded. In what? In what? In love. Wow. So the first thing I want to say about a love-filled life is this. You can't have a love experience. You can't have a love life unless you have a foundation of love. You are to be rooted in love. You are to be grounded in love. And so as Christ fills your life, tell me what rules your life. When Christ rules, what rules you? Love. You will be ruled by love. Love is the foundation. Love is, is that which everything is built upon. The only way to live your life is to live a love-filled life. Yes or no? Do you guys all understand this? And I really want to say to you, you need to turn it on. Amen? I get hatred. I see it everywhere, right? I get the bitterness in this world. I get how people resent other people and don't forgive. But not you guys, right? If Christ lives in you, then tell me what lives in you. Not hate. That's only going to destroy you. Bitterness will destroy you. Unforgiveness will destroy you. He said, no, no, you are ruled. You are rooted. You are grounded in what? In love. Wow. Everybody wants a love life. And a love life springs out of right there. Brings out of what? Indwelling Christ, who permeates your life, who controls your life. Yes? If this isn't happening for you, just work your way back. If you say, you know, pastor, this love life, I don't live that way at all. Work your way back. Has the indwelling Christ and your growth in the indwelling Christ, has that happened for you? You say, well, maybe that's not even happened for you. Then go back to the inner man. Did God strengthen you in your inner man? Has he changed you in your inner man? Do you understand? Work your way back. <laughs> or work your way forward. But this is your ignition. Wow. It's the ignition. <sighs> hmm. He permeates that life. The greatest lover of the world lives where? Where does he live? Inside of you. He is the lover of your soul yes and he is the lover of this world and tell me where that lover lives in you and the more control you give to him the more love will permeate out of your life the more you surrender the more you're going to live like him well according to romans 5 5 i want you to open up your bibles there once you accept Christ into your life, I want you to see what happens. Romans 5.5 5 says this. The love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. This is what happened. The moment you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, Romans 5, 5 happened. <laughs> God's love comes in. His love is there. Wow. And that love is to be reflected where? Where? Everywhere. Wow. Everywhere. 
It's the most normal thing in the world for a Christian to love. And all God's people said, amen. There shouldn't be any question about this at all. It's normal. Now let me say it this way. If you don't experience a total life of love, it is not because it isn't there. Tell me what the reason is. It is there. It's because you've not surrendered to it. Amen? How many of you have surrendered it to it? You say, God, you love the world. And you're living in me. How many of you surrender to that? I pray that you do because it's not that he's not there. It may be some people just decided I'm not going to live that way. Wow. Let me ask you a question. Which is easier? To breathe or to hold your breath? Tell me which is easier. To breathe or to hold your breath? Well, you've been breathing all morning, right? You never even thought about it. You don't get up in the morning and say, I have to breathe. Keep breathing. Keep breathing. If I don't breathe, I'm going to die. <laughs> keep breathing or I'll die. Keep breathing. Don't stop. Keep breathing. I have to keep breathing. No. You breathe, period. That's it. But in converse, it's very difficult to hold your breath. You try for a long time, and eventually you explode. Why? It's difficult. You're fighting against the natural. Yes or no? Wow. But when you became a Christian, the most natural thing in the world for you to do is what? love the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart to permeate you yes it should exude out of all of us it should touch everybody around you amen it's actually a way of life for the Christian but some people are holding their breath and they are doing out of their own self-will. They hold their breath. They actually are resisting the love of God that is within them. They resist it. It's called selfish pride. They are living for themselves. This reality here is the reality God wants us to live right there. Wow. Love is the most normal thing for a Christian. Amen? I want you to go to, I want you to look at another scripture. I want you to look at verse 18, Ephesians 3, 18. Second element, not only it's foundational that you are rooted and you're grounded in love, it's foundational for your life, but I want you to see verse 18. Very sequential what happens next. So that... You may be able to what? So that you might be able to comprehend this love. I looked up this word in the Greek, comprehend. Do you know what it means? I have a, I think I changed that a little bit based on the original language. Do you know what the actual language actually says? To comprehend means to seize. The word comprehend means to grasp for your own. What do you think? You not only have a life that is built on love, but you have a life that possesses love as a personal possession. You literally seize love. You make it your own. You live that way. And so it is then that we not only have a foundation of love when Christ comes and lives inside of you, but we seize that love. We grasp the opportunity to love other people. It's your personal treasure. It's yours. 
It's your personal possession. Wow. What do you guys think? How many of you are doing that? How many of you are going out in life, knowing he's living in you, and you go, there's a hurting person. You grab. There's someone who's crying. You grab. You say, there's someone who's struggling. You grab. Someone is really, things aren't working out in their life. You grab. That's what it means. You are grabbing. You are seeing the need in this world. And the son of the living God is living in you. And you are seizing it. You're grabbing it. And your life is changing. And everyone else around you's life is changing. Because it's not you anymore. It is the love of Christ in you. I want to talk about this not as a philosophy, but a reality of what it means to be a Christian. Because this is a reality for the Christian. This is how we turn on this. <laughs> wow. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, this happened to me. I want to get back to my story. I began second grade, a new school in a classroom. Uh... With a love-filled nun. Her name was Sister Miriam. She was jolly and she was fun as nuns went. I was nervous and losing confidence all day long. In my mind, don't forget, I'm a failure. Nothing good is ever going to happen to me. <laughs> wow. And so... I did what I always did on the first day of school. Some of you may have done it too. You go in the room, put your head down, you sit in the last row, in the last seat. <laughs> that was me. I never looked up. I didn't want to look at anybody. I didn't want to talk with anybody. Sister Miriam knew it the minute I walked in that room. Because on the second day of school, you know what she said? Danny, come sit up here. In the most loving voice I've ever heard. I want you near me. I want you to sit by me. I really care about you. Come up here. And I went, you, you, you don't mean me, right? You can't mean me. <laughs> and I got up from the back of the last row put my head down, folded my arms, and did what she told me to do. I was sitting in the first seat. Ah, she said, now that's a lot better. We're going to be able to hear everything you have to say to this class. <laughs> I'm like, I don't ever talk in class. What do you mean you're going to hear me? I have nothing to say. Don't you understand? I'm invisible. I'm a failure. Oh, my goodness. Well, the next thing Sister Miriam explained to me was that in a classroom, she had privileges for those who served other people and who loved people well. And the reward of loving people well was you got to clean the boards at the end of the day. And she would say, this is a reward for a special student every day. And they have a privilege at the end of the day. She said, it's time to clean the board. And she looked around. She said, who's the special person in the class who's going to clean the boards? She said, now all of you in this class are special. But she said, I have one special person I want. To let them know how special they are. And guess what? It was me. I had my head down, my hands folded. She came over and said, well, it's you. You are very, very special. You are the one who are going to be able to clean the boards. And then she did the most amazing thing to me. She said, now class, he knows how to clean the boards the right way. He's going to demonstrate for all of you how to do this correctly because he's a very special, special kid. And I'm up there. <laughs> like, you got to be kidding me. Wow. She took my hand and she demonstrated the way for me to do it and she told everybody to follow me. Wow. First time in school. 
first time in school that I actually smiled. First time. Wow. I want to show you guys a video of something else that Sister Miriam did for me. And I want you to watch it very, very carefully. The way I play basketball today and run around is really the same thing I did when I was in second grade. But to Sister Miriam, my hyperactivity on the playground turned into a compliment. She would say to me, you're so fast out there when you're on that playground. I bet you no one can catch you. To Sister Miriam, my learning disability was, look at how much you've grown and improved. I'm so proud of you, she'd say to me. To Sister Miriam, my shifting feet, wiggling body in a seat, was to her, you have so much energy. You're going to do great things in the world someday. To Sister Miriam, I was smart, talented, and funny. I was a good athlete, and to her, I was a leader. I never felt any of those things. But in Sister Miriam's class, I became all of those things. This woman, who was yielded to the Spirit, who allowed the Christ in her to permeate her life, lived a life of love and changed the direction of my life, one nine-month period when I was eight years old, set the pattern for my achievements, my determination, my ministry, my family, my wife, my children, my love for God, all of it because of that woman who yielded and lived a love-filled life and who said, you're not a failure, you're wonderful. I left second grade, top reader in the class, I went on to become a student body president, captain of my basketball team, and I ended up going on for four advanced degrees. Her love life changed me. And I want to say to you, your love-filled life can change other people. What do you think? How many people? One. And what did she do? Changed my whole life. And she only did one thing for me. What was that? She loved me. Do you guys understand this? Because that same Jesus Christ is in you, right? You've did the work. You've been strengthened in your inner man by the power of the Holy Spirit. You understand at a deeper level, Christ is taking over your life. You are saying, yes, take over my life, Jesus. And then you know he's filling you with a love that nobody else has. He's putting it in you. And if you will turn on the ignition. You turn this on. You take what's over here, which is the love of God, the wisdom of God, the peace of God, the power of God. You have it all. And you look at the things that are happening over here in your life, and you go, you know what? I got to turn on the ignition. So turn it on. You know it's very, very clear. This word from the Lord is about as clear as you're going to get for transformational power in the life of a believer. Do and let the Spirit of God do the inner work in you. Let him grow more and more so you realize he's a real person in the fullness of who he is as the Son of God living inside of you and saying to you, I have filled you with my love. You now go out to the world. Grab on to these people who are far. Grab on to hurting people. Grab on to those who are suffering. Grab on to those who are struggling. Grab on to those who are depressed. I put that in you. Live it out. Do it. That is how we're to live. Amen? And I really want to encourage you guys. Make a decision. To live this way. Christianity is more than a philosophy. Amen. Christianity is more than I read my Bible. Let the actions. That you know that would follow Jesus Christ. Because the word of God is very very clear. Very very clear. I think we would all say the clearness of the word of God is so clear. We don't have to question it. We know how to live. So do you. I love the Word of God because it is so clear about how to live. Don't minimize it. Don't try to change it. Submit to it. 
and all those things that are happening around you, let Christ use you. And all God's people said, Amen. I want to encourage you. Maybe there are people around you and they're hurting. Don't be inactive. You do the grabbing. You do the comprehending. Seize those people. Seize those opportunities. And make a difference for Jesus Christ. And pray as Paul prayed. That we would all understand how this works. And then we would obey it. And live it. And do it. <laughs> so Christ can use you and me. In a world that's hurting everywhere. Wow. I like to say he's a smart God. <laughs> and guess what? He is very, very smart. <laughs> he knows why he put you here. Amen? You're not a regular person, guys. You're not just some person passing through. You're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Live for him. Even when it's hard. Even when it's get, you're struggling. Just say, you know what? I'm going to do this. Make a decision. It requires a decision. It requires a decision. Make it. Let God use you in a powerful way for his name and for his kingdom. In closing today, I want us to sing this song, Jesus Messiah. And as we're singing it, know he's living in you. He's inside of you, this Jesus. Sing it and know he's in you. Let's sing it together. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross, love so amazing. Love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. Rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body. The bread, his blood, the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing. Love
God. All the glory, All the glory God, to you. To you. Yes, God. You, Lord. God. Light of the world. The light, light of, of the, the world. world. All our hope, hope is, is in, in you. you. Our hope. All our hope is in you. All the Light of the world. The light of the world. God, thank you. Jesus, Messiah. Mm, Lord. Name above all names. Name. Blessed. Blessed Redeemer. Yes, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Thank you, Lord. You're Emmanuel. Oh, the rescue for sinners. The ransom from heaven. Jesus, Messiah. He's the Lord of all. Lord of all. Hallelujah. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that great? And where does he live? Right inside of you and me. It's amazing, isn't it? Life-changing, transformational, for sure. <laughs> wow. In closing today, I want to remind you about our Christmas blessing. Uh, we still have needs on our tree. You can help us by coming up to the tree and taking a tag. Uh, if you're online and you could call, we'd love to have you take one of the names and help us uh, help, help someone else have a great Christmas. Reminder of upcoming Christmas events that we have scheduled. If you're online uh, and you need this kind of a connection with a local church family, fill out that comment card. We'd love to be in touch with you and have you join us, be part of us. Next week... Please go to the website, register online, your whole family. Stay committed to church attendance. I know it's difficult, but do not grow weary in well-doing. Amen. Stay committed to the body of Christ, whether you're here or online. Wow. Don't forget to join us every night, 8 o'clock, on Facebook. We're there every night. Uh, sunglasses. It's a great time just to be together, share the word. I really want to encourage you to share this broadcast. You know, there's so many people right now hurting, upset, discouraged, depressed. Let the word of God go out to them. Amen. It's the word of God that will change all of our lives. It is powerful. It is mighty. If you care about people, share the word with them. Let God transform them lives. You don't have to transform them. Let God do that work. Amen. That's his work. And lastly, I want to thank you guys for uh, Thanksgiving week. I'm grateful for all of you. It's time of Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's a great time to be together as a family of God. also want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I know you guys, uh, sometimes it's hard to give, but I know many of you are maintaining being faithful, and I want to encourage you to keep doing that. Amen. God will reward you. Don't worry about man or the times we're living in. Amen. God will reward those who are faithful. He's the one watching. Amen. He's the one we're pleasing. So have a blessed week this week, and uh, I'll see you guys back here next week, and keep growing and acknowledging who your Savior is. In Jesus' name I pray, and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys.